Good morning. Buenos días. Oh, hola. <laughs> ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo está? Okay, ask me no more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that reminds me of this great scene in Family Guy. Uh, I think he's on a plane, but Peter, the the main character, the dad, uh, he he's like on a plane or whatever, going to Mexico or something, and the the flight attendant asks him some question in Spanish, and it's some like long question, right? Uh, and then he like responds in Spanish, and then she there's like one more thing where he comes back, and then after that he just like blinks and he's like. I only know that <laughs> these were two very oddly specific things yeah. that I know nothing else in in Spanish. That's about right. Yeah, I was watching a Mythic <laughs> Quest the other night, and of course, uh, the creative director in the in the episode is uh, kind of got a Napoleon complex, you know, short guy that has to be the alpha in everything, nice. and it's really funny. And uh, bumps into this guy who's like six five, and uh, of course, like as he walked into the office, he was talking Spanish with this lady. And then he, you know, goes over to his desk, and then the guy asks him this really long question once again. And uh, and, and if you know any Spanish, you could kind of pick up on the context right. that he was talking about Gabriel Marquez's Thousand Years of Solitude or something. And so you kind of go, and then, of course, the creative director blanks out, and he goes, no, I don't speak Spanish. I know those three <laughs> sentences, and we just do that routine every morning so that I look good. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. He wants to look bilingual without actually being bilingual. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I find this to be like, uh, yeah, that's about my my introduction to Spanish. That's the level I'm at. Is I want to look like I'm bilingual, but yeah. Oh, well, that was very good. You know, with Thanks. the whole Buenos Dias thing. You, well, thank you. Really, you. <laughs> thank you. You know, there's something about faking it until yeah, you make yeah, it, or just I, faking it forever. Right? Uh, it's just yeah. I, that is actually my goal for next year is to pick up a second language. I've done Spanish where I've gotten decent, and then I fall behind, and then I get decent again, and I fall behind. So, I think next year I'm going to do another push. Yeah, so that's for me. So I'm my last name's Garcia, as you know, um, and I'm actually a quarter Mexican, but yet my grandpa married a, a very American white lady, and we got, and then raised the family in Mississippi. So there wasn't a large need for Spanish. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so he he my grandpa doesn't even speak Spanish anymore. He did when he was a, a little kid. But after that, it was like, ah, you know, in America, what's the what's the point, right? Uh, but he, uh, <laughs> anyways, so I, I didn't learn any Spanish from my family, um, but I, I did learn some in high school. But I, I want to become fluent. You know, I, I, I'm, what I would say, I'm conversational right now. Like, I can get across anything I want to get across, and I can understand what someone else is trying to tell me. Uh, I may have to ask them to either slow down or reword it or whatever um, in certain cases. But for the most part, I could follow. Now, if it's like, you know, the super fast, especially like as a lot of Mexican people like to do, talk really, really, really fast and maybe join some words and maybe add in some slang, like then it gets a little bit harder. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, you know, so I grew up in New Mexico. And if anyone should know Spanish, it's me. <laughs> the one state where they actually have Mexico in the name? Come on. Yeah, I know. So strange. I think there's also something about, um, you know, I remember talking to somebody before who you know certain generations of people would ban languages from their house they didn't want their children knowing their language they only wanted them knowing english or whatever else and, and without was, the accent ideally right not. right it, it was yeah. a way to assimilate and be successful and now all the people that had you know the children that went through that are like oh i missed out on such an opportunity and the parents were like i did you a huge blessing you know, and uh, I find that sort of shift to be pretty strange, like how our, our societies have shifted back the opposite direction now. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you know, my the typical when you think of like someone who's at least in America, or at least in popular media, you th the most popular kind of, uh, I don't know, trope is a, a guy or a girl who's partially black, partially white, and they like try and you, they don't pass for either type of right, thing, right? Right. Um, well, uh, or or doing judging people by their names or things like oh, that. Oh right? yeah, yeah. So when my parents moved here in the late '80s or something in the Dallas area, um, <clears throat> when they were calling places to, hey, we've got we're looking for an apartment or whatever, they got a lot of no's um, over the phone, and then they would go into those places later on, and be like, oh. Oh, automatically you guys have some some vacancy now. You guys are available because yeah. oh, your last name is Garcia, so we decided that we couldn't. Oh so it's like, man, yeah. So some of those things before it's like, but then when they show up with their pretty white faces, 
things change. Oh, that kind of hurts. Yeah. 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 yeah but yeah, you know, what what can you do? That's that's kind of how how yeah. it happens sometimes, right? And yeah. even with like resumes and getting jobs and things like that, you know, that's a, a thing about putting putting your name on there and or you know and now in this wor- world there's a question of oh do i put a picture or not and it's like oh, oh right. you know me personally like from the the thinking people are good and hoping people are good and all that kind of stuff it's like oh yeah definitely have a picture you know it makes it more personable you know who it is but then me knowing how animalistic we are and all the bad wiring we have and all the biases that kick in even without us knowing it it's like uh, i don't know maybe it's not a picture yeah yeah and that's you know there was a a thing for a while where it was kind of like uh and I, I might be going too far on this but there was this kind of form i was filling out and it was asking me and this happens with a lot of um, artist grants and artist opportunities is they ask you a whole bunch of questions about sexual orientation preference gender of course they you know how do you identify and you don't have to answer any of these things but i also was thinking you're probably telling them a lot by not answering these things yeah because the people probably choosing not to answer these things might be thinking it it's not so much privacy but in that i might being hurt be hurt or this would be held against me to answer these questions honestly yeah uh, but then again, if you get the grant or whatever, or the submission, then you're like, well, they're going to know anyway. Well, so, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of like, you know, there's this, there's this little weird, um, set of hoops that we're now jumping through that I, I, maybe they existed before. I remember I'm something like a 64th native American. It's so little, it doesn't even really matter, but I think it was enough to actually be included into some sort of uh, class action judgments and suits and things like that. So my parents were like, always put this down on that you're Native American or whatever. And I'm like, but I'm not. Yeah, well, that, that well, that's an interesting thing, right? Because, <clears throat> you know, you just like a lot of people and, you know, I would say me too, like 164th is not very much. But then when it's like, oh, well, seeing as that, that entire race or whatever you want to call it, um, ethnicity, I don't know the correct term for, yeah. for that. Um, but, uh, was, you know, largely wiped off of the planet. It's like, oh, well maybe those smaller fractions are a little bit more important because right. it was a smaller pool to come from. Right. That was one thing I was just listening to, uh, a podcast last week where he was talking about, uh, the small, smallpox vaccine and it was talking about how, you know, it was weaponized back then. Oh yes. And how yeah. I was like, oh, well, let's just give them these like dirty, blankets and things like that yeah, and then and it's like actually oh. put smallpox on the blankets right i mean it's the most horrendous kind of warfare uh i i mean there's just oh and it was like something like 90 percent of the population or something yeah it just gets decimated like by a disease yeah and uh, i mean it's it's really pretty disgusting the way some of that worked out is like here's the gift and this gift will kill you i mean it's it's horrible yeah yeah it, not, not only was it that that uh, I forget the technical term for it, but using a, a sickness or illness as as a warfare. But then it was under the guise of a gift. It was yeah. that was yeah that's bad. Um, but the other one I wanted to, to talk about um, was as you're saying that it made me think of the census, which at least with the grants and stuff, people have some incentive. They get some benefit from exposing, sharing that information about mm-hmm. themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Well, with the census, it's a problem too, especially here in Texas. Is like you know, undocumented people, uh, oh, and, yeah. and it's like, oh, I don't want to participate in this because I'm worried about the government finding me and kicking me out and all those kind of things. Even though there are laws and protections and stuff in place t- to prevent that, it's just literally supposed to be a information gathering. That stuff can't be held against you, things like that. But one, like, what's the, why is it worth the risk? Uh, and two, you know, in case of some some of these people, like maybe their English isn't the best either. And then three, why would they trust? trust them anyways right especially coming from a a, a place like mexico where you know there is historically some sort of distrust with the government and authority already right right and there's you know um sort of rampant corruption as the norm in certain countries and that's just the way they operate and the premise that i've heard is it's like well you know i'm a government official and you know we don't make any money so our only way to actually make a living is to take bribes or yeah. something like this. Interesting. This becomes, and when that's built into the entire society, then you just start going like, oh man, like this is, you know, it's like tipping your waiter, but like you tip the cops, you tip the congressman, <laughs> you tip, you know, everybody. Yeah. Well, it's funny because uh, <clears throat> someone was just telling me the other day about they had 
um, you know, a friend of a friend or something had some sort of, they, they were Mexican, they had some family in the Mexican government or whatever, and it's like, oh, yeah, you know, our uncle gets uh, kidnapped by the cartel every month. Uh, but th- that's just so they can get the bribe. I'm like, well, well, why don't they just just set up the the money? Like, th- can they just, just take out? Venmo. Can you not inconvenience me? I'll right. go ahead and give you the money. <laughs> yeah, no. That's that's really funny too because it's still like uh, once it becomes that transactional, then it's kind of like you know the guys that are doing all the robbing are like, well, this isn't fun anymore. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah that, that that's funny. But you know, it, it's a good. It's a good transition to our topic for today, which is going to be talking a little bit about travel, um, a little bit of vacation, a little bit about marketing and consumerism and things like that. But, um, but yeah, because um, you know, one of the things I was saying about the the Mexican um, who had the government official and the cartel, it's like, you know, I don't I don't know the entire full story, but based on the way it was told to me, it didn't sound like that person's life was in danger or anything like that it, because it become this regular thing. But yet now that person who's involved is like, well, I'm never going to go to Mexico because the cartel kidnaps people. And it's like, ah, well, I mean, there's a difference between that. And, and oh, by the way, that person is involved in the Mexican government. So therefore, the chance and they're regularly getting paid was <laughs> extortion is the word, yes, right? Yes, they're yes. being extorted. So naturally, if they're regularly being extorted, that right. puts them at a higher risk <laughs> for that type of thing. Then, for example, an average tourist going to a touristy area uh, that is very safe, right? But yet people use this extrapolation and it's like, oh, I'm never going to this entire country now because of that one thing in that one area. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, it, you know, it, it also speaks to uh, what is it that <clears throat> availability kind of thing where we, we, you know, we pull from the thing that's immediate knowledge and then we base our decisions yeah. around it. And, and this seems to be something that happens quite a bit. But, yeah, Mexico is great. I've been several times. I've been shaken down a couple of times, um, usually for, you know, the equivalent of $20. You know, the ca- the cabbie is upset. You know, it's something like that. It's And, you know, and then they'll say, well, I'll go to the police. And then the thing is with the police is then you have to have more money when they get involved. Yeah. And it just, like, it keeps going. And so there is this kind of premise, though, that, they also don't want to run you off. They don't want to. It's in their best interest to keep you yes. alive and safe because they just want a little bit of money. They don't actually want to take yeah. you to the station. They don't actually want to do any of these things. So it's a sort of an intricate game or a dance. There's this kind of balance that gets played. Of course, there's also horror stories that come out of this. Yeah. And so you know, I don't know where I land on any of that. It's kind of, um, it's also kind of strange when you go to a foreign country and there's you know. Uh, what seem to be police, but it's actually military walking around with AK 47s or ARs or something like this. And you're just like, Whoa, <laughs> like, Hey, how safe is this place? <laughs> right. And, but I remember being in uh, Mexico and seeing that. And in Mexico, it was like, wow, this is scary. Go to Barcelona. And we're in Spain. Same thing. And I was just like, Oh, okay. Come to Texas. That's just a random dude. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's just church on a Sunday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Yeah, no, the the gun thing is interesting because, uh, so, I just got back from a trip. Uh, you know, we're back back at the the couch live. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so we we went to um, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, which is uh, just east of Knoxville, maybe about an hour or so. Um, and in the airport, uh, as we were coming back from Knoxville, they have all these signs, uh, little pictures, and it said, Officer Smith. Uh, prevented this gun from going on the plane two weeks ago and i'm like really what's the point and it shows a picture of like the gun and the ammo and i'm like okay l- l- how many of these and there's like a bunch of these pictures and they're all from like within the last month or so- something like that i'm like i'm pretty sure those people probably just forgot their gun in their bag or on their person or whatever and it's not like they're like you're really keeping us that much safer by doing that and i was like what is the point of that like what are you going for there i I didn't get it. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of pushback that, um, you know, there has been a movement that, and we don't need to go too far down this rabbit trail, but the idea of the citizen militia, so to speak, where all these citizens are the ones that are going to defend against the next 9-11 or whatever else it is. And the, it's interesting to think about the TSA is always a hassle to get through. And so they have to keep sort of validating that, yes, indeed, we are doing our jobs. But you've probably seen some of the stats that come out, and I think they miss like 78% of attempts to get through with things. So when they're tested, they sort of fail miserably, even though they create so much hardship for everybody. And so there is this idea of like, well, why do you still exist? 
and if you're not if you aren't actually accomplishing your purpose and one of the things that i've heard, come up with or thought about before is that it's a fantastic employment system so we have so many people that are now employed by the government through tsa i think it'd be really hard to unwind that entire system uh, it's also ends up saying the thing of like okay we're all safe again you know how do you do that 20 years after 9 11 right in a crazier and less just and yeah. <laughs> everything's worse kind of world yeah. how can you do it how can you do this <laughs> yeah that's one of the funny things is you people tend to not give up control once they've got that control in place but also there's a lot of things when we're talking about traveling my wife went to uh tried to come over to italy to see me a few years ago when i was over there working on a project and her passport was rejected and they were like she was like but it's not expired yet and they're like yeah, but it will be expired within like 90 days. Right. And she's just like, but it's not like expiration dates are expiration dates. And they're like, yeah, we don't allow you to travel 90 days before <laughs> it's expired into Italy. And she's like, well, why not? And they go, because America does it to us. So now we're doing it back to yeah, Americans. That idea of reciprocity. <laughs> yeah. No, that's <laughs> a like... very, very real thing that when we were traveling in South America, it's like, all right, go in this country is free. Go in this country this is free. Go in this country is free. Go in this one country. Oh, it, it's going to be 120 US dollars. I'm like, "What? That's like a year's <laughs> salary in this country." And I'm exaggerating, right? But it's is a very large amount of money. Yeah, yeah. Uh one for anyone, uh not not anyone, right? But you know what I mean? For that's a significant when you're young traveling kids. This is a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. But especially when you compare, you know, the value of the dollar to where that place is, like that money goes a very long way. And it was like, "Yeah, that's because you America charges us for when we get in there." Yeah, it's so strange that how um, we think that all these other countries are being unfair to us, but it's our country being unfair in the first place. Yeah. And you just go, oh, okay, I guess like this is like the uh, the tax of being American when you go anywhere else. Is oh, you have yeah. to put up with the, the way that America treats and bullies other countries as in the way you get treated and bullied. And so, but of course, on a lesser degree. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. But um, yeah, speaking of travel, have you done a lot of international travel? Yeah, so I've been to, uh, I think the count is 10 countries, um, and uh, most of that was on the South America trip on, on with my brother. Uh, so we spent three weeks, um, and we went through, uh, I think, four or five uh, countries. It was uh, Peru, uh, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador. Um, and yeah, I think that, I think those were the four and that also included the Galapagos Islands, which is part of Ecuador. Um, and that was really cool. Um, that was an awesome trip. Uh, and it was very, very beautiful, lots of really good food, lots of, um, uh, good people and a really good time. So that, that was my largest stint of uh, international travel. And other than that, it's been a series of kind of, I'll call them, you know, cruises and, and uh, resort type of places, right? Um, so various parts of Mexico um, and Dominican Republic. Uh, and then I'll, I could name a couple other I can't think of off the top of my head. But in the Caribbean type of thing where you stop for, you know, a, a day in port yeah, or whatnot. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I haven't made the, ju the jump over to Europe yet. Um, excuse me. Um, but that's on the list. It was That was one of the, hey... Maybe in 2020, we'll go do that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so we're still still looking to plan that one. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to go at least to every continent. I'm, no, I'm not, probably not going to make every country in the world, but uh, I, 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 I enjoy it very much. And uh, oh, Mexico City was really cool um, and very accessible too from, you know, it was like $200 flight or something like that uh, but back when I got it in from LA. And that was, you know, before COVID. I bet right now I'd be surprised if it's even cheaper. Mm. Um, or especially from Dallas, you know, I'm sure there's plenty yeah. of travel between Dallas and Mexico. Yeah, that would make sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, no, I don't know. I've never been to Mexico city, but I watch, you know, you watch movies, you see things and you're just like, this is a great place. And be considering I've probably been to Mexico a dozen times, maybe more then it's silly for me not to have been to Mexico city. And I, so I find that to be shocking, but yeah, it's because the tourist flight towns to the, you know, you go to the beaches and they have a package deal set up and it just makes it all easy. And it's almost always where your friends want to go anyway. Like most of my friends are not like Mexico city. Most of them are right. like, no, like let's go to, you know, whatever, Puerto Vallarta. 
or something like right. this. And then we just go sit on a beach. Yeah, or Cancun or yeah, you know yeah. Cozumel or whatever. All right. those places. And I mean, one that's because you know those places are built to cater towards that audience, and mm-hmm. they're kind of you know. I don't know the official designation, so you know, have have some g- grace with me here, audience. But you know, there's the dev- designation, right? First world country, second world country, third world country. Another another term that's used is a developing country, right? And uh, and you know, where the countries are in our mind is one very different than you know where they actually are. And then of course, what we think and perceive and how things look is of course different than the the technical definitions, right? But as an American coming from extremely pretty and well-developed and designed areas with the the roads are all very nice, the buildings are all built to a very specific code, and not just that, but they're all themed in a certain way, right? You <laughs> right, know, right. and it's all like super very looking a specific way. Well, then you go to some of these other countries, um, especially like in Latin America, and it's like, oh, it looks kind of like run down, kind of has that mm-hmm. feel. And it's like, oh, it's just like, that's just different. And there are lots of pros and cons that come with that, right? I I, th- I think more colorful is a term that comes to mind. And also literally a lot of times it is more colorful, which I like much more than just the, the bricks and the, the tans and the whites and, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and also some of it's like, for example, in a lot of Latin American countries, when people are building a house um, or any building, they actually they build the the first floor or whatever, and then they just leave the rebar exposed because they're going to expand in the future. And so they actually build the first floor while it's accessible and they can afford it and things like that. And then as the, the family grows or they make more money or whatever, then they just build up. But because of that, you have these exposed rebar all around. So it's yeah. like, eh, it looks in, and obviously just like anywhere else, I'm sure this varies this varies based off where you are, right? But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I, I don't know. So I kind of like that idea. It's like, oh, we need an accessible home that people can afford and have the ability to grow. Like that's nice, but you gotta look at the rebar. So pros and cons, right? <laughs> yeah, right. No, it, it's um one of the tenets of architecture is to actually when you're planning a house, you're, you're building an office, a shop, whatever the heck it is, is be thinking of expanding in the future and leave openings and spaces for that to happen. It's I mean, that's what good architecture is supposed to do, which, by the way, is how you know you're living in uh, cookie-cutter homes in the suburbs when that does not exist for you. Right. Right, so because they've already maximized out everything to the nth degree. But, you know, there's also something about that rebar sticking up and everything where I'm sure here it would just be against zoning ordinance or against code, so you'd have to trim all that off. So we sort of don't allow for these options. And I was thinking about this this weekend because, as you all know, I've... uh, If you've been listening, then I've got a shop built at my place now, but I'm also building out some stuff on the interior. And what's fascinating is every attempt that I've kind of had to try to be creative within building this shop has kind of been thwarted by the economics of it. So any kind of attempt to sort of really be creative, to make something slightly different, to do this, to do, you know, well, what if I don't put this on the sidewall? What if I put this here? What if I, oh, well, you can do that, but it will just cost X. What if you don't build in a perfect rectangle? Oh, well, that will cost this, right? And all of a sudden the costs just start going through the roof. And so every time that I tried to be creative, it ended up getting thwarted by sort of rational efficiency. And I found that to be sort of interesting to think that, to be creative requires a tremendous push in our current environment. Uh, so anyway, we could talk about all that later, but it was just a little epiphany that landed yeah. on me. No, no, I, I like that. And <clears throat> we can talk about it a, l- a little bit too. Um, because what was popping in my mind um, was how, yes, I actually was talking about this the other day um, because I was saying how one of the nice things about Europe um, or South America um, is the architecture when you go to these places. And yeah. some of that's because the places are so old that you get to see these buildings, these walls, these whatever, these things that have been built a really long time ago in this very particular way, uh, and a lot of it very labor-intensive and expensive. And it's like we will never see buildings built like that again because yeah. of that very reason that you're talking about because it's too expensive and people have now they have all these construction techniques and oh but but yeah they're willing to say oh this building is probably going to start falling apart around 30 years uh, or at least need some changes or work but you know that's not it doesn't justify the cost for us to make one that could last i don't know hundreds or thousands of years like some of these traditional ones yeah that's that's a big a really big shift and and one thing is it also of course um, a lot of these buildings that are classic that will last for thousands of years are funded by government or the church. 
Um, so these institutions that have a vested interest in sticking around that long. So there's also sort of an incentive idea behind some of this too. But one of the things that um, we could talk about a little too when you get into travel is how unique America is for its architecture. And it can seem very much like throwaway architecture, that it's not meant to last for long periods of time. So even when you're talking about rebar sticking out of something, that means it's made out of either, you know, cinder blocks or concrete or something that's going to last for a while. So these houses are actually built to be hurricane proof or whatever else in, in these various areas. And they want them to last. In America, we do a lot of things out of wood frame construction. And yeah. some of that can last, but it, it also has a tendency to have to be touched up and rebuilt and have other issues. Um, there is a guy, uh, Umberto Echo, who is, I think, European. I think he's a guy French, I want to say. But he came back. He came through America in the 80s and was just blown away by uh, everything that he saw here. And the book is called Travels in Hyperreality. Um, because it's one of the interesting things he talks about there. And then I want to sort of maybe touch on him a little bit and then talk about Venturi Brown's book, Learning from Las Vegas, in which they point out this kind of idea of building a shed, uh-huh. like a, a just a white box out of the cheapest material possible, and then declaring it to be a church by putting a sign on it that says church or putting a cross on it is a very American thing. <laughs> in, in Europe, you actually build... A church that looks like a church. A shrine. Well, yeah, the the shape of the church tells you that it's a church. But in America, we build boxes and we claim them to be something by putting a sign on them, which is just mind-blowing for anyone from these old world countries. They're like, no, no, the form follows the functions. Churches look like this. Soccer stadiums look like this. You know, homes look like this. And they kind of have this architecture that's centered around the purpose of the thing. But in America, we just build boxes and label them. And this also gets into the superficiality. So when I was talking about Umberto Eco's travels in hyperreality, there is a, a symbolic collapse where in America we lean into the pattern and the symbol. We lean into the abstraction and do everything else as cheap as possible. And of course, this also ties into Protestant work ethic and the economics of saving and being appearing to be frugal is championed in America. Yes. So, you know, <laughs> and yet you're frugal on one end so that you can go buy a boat and a lake house on the other. Right. So it's a it's this real trade-off. It, well, it's a, that's a really interesting point, especially the, you know, the tend towards frugality or whatever, because, you know, at least, <laughs> I, I would say at least anecdotally, but that's just because I don't have the stats in front of me. But I've heard lots and lots of examples of it in media about how it doesn't matter, you know, if someone has millions and millions of dollars or if they're scraping by, like, you know, obviously there's different personalities and mindsets around money, but I, I've heard plenty of people, you know, licking the silver spoon who are still talking about getting a deal, right? Or it's yeah. like, and there's plenty of uh, companies that lean into it super hard. Uh, one of the good examples here in America is a company called Kohl's. And there's literally nothing is ever full price. Like it's always, and it's not just a a person, a little percentage off. It's always like 40% or 70% off. Right. And then it's like, Oh, well, if you come in today, like we'll give you extra, we'll give you $20 of Kohl's cash. And they have like all of these, it's just all marketing and psychology. And it's like, you just walk in and, and you know, I've heard many people say like, Oh, well, you know, especially I I wouldn't be surprised as how it started was here's how you justify it to the, your man when you get home, yeah. you know, after you buy the I, thing. I got all this at 50% yeah, off. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it was 70, but now it's only 35. And it's like, oh my gosh, it just hurts my head. It's still $35 though. Yeah. Like, yeah, but there's, uh, it was the same. I, I did this brief stint working in Michael's, the, ho- the sort of alternate Crap to Hobby scene. Lobby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I worked in the frame shop there. And uh, I had worked in a previous frame shop that was like, a real frame shop that did you know stuff for galleries and everything else and uh and the the shift going to michael's was sort of insane but also nothing was ever if anyone ever paid full price i i i just <laughs> ethically couldn't handle it and i was like there's a coupon you know <laughs> just always trying to like point them into any sort of resource because you know, you come in on a certain day and all of the canvases to make paintings on are 50% off. So the idea that you would pay full price there ever was sort of a, um, 
yeah it just sort of a joke yeah. like is it, it but it, i'm sure they're pulling it over on lots of people but then also the people that are regulars there they're they feel like they're regulars because they have this like inside knowledge yeah and so a I'm, lot of layers with that one huh? yeah i'm kind of curious about this inside knowledge too when it comes to things like traveling because everyone that goes you know we're talking about going to these resorts in mexico and you feel like you're getting this really good deal this inside deal and that's leading you to keep going to these resorts or when you go to vegas people get these like perks from yeah. continuing to go back mm -hmm. over and over again well that also gets into another one which we can we can touch on or not um which is just the the frequent flyer or the frequent traveler type mm -hmm. of programs mm -hmm. right um, which one of the things that they give you, one of the things they afford you is this status and this like in-group. And then especially if you happen to be traveling with people, you can be like, oh, hey, you know, you guys are with me today, so we can go over to the lounge, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm special and I'm in because I've got this lounge access. Don't matter that I either paid an annual price to get into this or the fact that I've just spent so much money overall that this company is willing to give me a little bit. Don't pay no mind to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it is funny and then you know it's after you've flown I don't know every other week for 6 or 7 months then all of a sudden you get sort of upgraded and you're always flying sort of first class or whatever it is and you have access you get free wi-fi you get all these sort of perks if you stay loyal to this mm -hmm. company and yeah i we're we're kind of a sucker for this idea of giving away things for free and i was listening to this podcast this weekend and a marketing guy was talking about how if you want they ran these experiments where somebody would walk into a mcdonald's and if they gave them a balloon for free then they would go they the family that was given the balloon would spend 12 percent more than an average family on food wow so the idea that you give somebody a little keychain you give them something like that would work and then what some people were doing was actually giving people a free piece of food some sort of sample ice cream something when they walked in the door and everyone else was some certain people were like well don't give them food if they came there to buy food because they need to be spending their money on your food but those people that you served of an immediate need when they walked in and you gave them food would spend 24 percent more wow on food it's because you solved their immediate need so they valued that freebie so much that they would spend more money there so there is a psychology of reciprocity you brought up reciprocity earlier but there's an entire psychology to it we live in a culture that we feel bad to take and not give back so if certain marketing people do manipulate that tendency yeah well let me talk about one area of travel where i like to give back and that's when I go to the restroom, you know, <laughs> on the plane, uh, not on the plane, but yes, on the plane. But I'm actually referring to when you're traveling and you've got to stop to go to the bathroom, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I just got gas, you know, just not too long ago. I don't need to. And we're back. Oh, looks like we've had a lorem ipsum down here. Yeah, I've noticed that, that, sh that should be the title of this episode because nice. we're just kind of rambling anyway. <laughs> Do you know any Latin? Uh, that's it. Lorem <laughs> ipsum. <laughs> Oh, man. And, of course, this mic stand just keeps failing on me, too. Things are falling apart behind the oh, scenes over you here. You should never leave town. That's yeah, I the know message. What happens? Yeah, because every time you come back, <laughs> <laughs> everything's a mess. Uh, so, so, uh, you, you got any idea where we had an internet issue? The internet just went out on us in the middle of uh, our Yeah, so who knows where y'all were stranded, uh, on that. But... I think we caught it relatively quickly. Okay, okay, yeah. good, good. Well, Reed caught it. Yeah, I, I saw it out of the corner of my uh, eye. I was just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Classic writer, blah, blah, blabbing. Um, all right, any idea of context where we were? Should we just... Oh, uh, we were once again sort of cycling back into uh you were talking about bathrooms uh, and paying, being yeah. in south america yes and okay so pay. that uh, having to pay to go to the bathroom which you know which is funny because uh just on this trip uh one of the things that came up we were talking about uh pet sitting and um there's these services out there not sponsored or whatever called rover that's one example of one where it connects you with people to watch your dogs and we were talking about how uh you know whether it be that or airbnb like one of the most common things to happen is after you use those services, the owner or whatever, or the, the dog sitter to say, hey, next time you need something, just give me a call or an email. Like, don't use the platform because yeah, they don't yeah. want to pay that 15%. And it's yeah. like, 
but that's literally how we found you. That's literally the point of the service. Like it just makes me mad, honestly, as a, yeah. as a business yeah. a guy who runs a business, it's like you, your, your whole business literally exists because of me. And yet you can't pay this 15%. And Oh, by the way, there's other protections and stuff that the end consumer gets by uh, oh, yeah. going on the platform and things like that. But but yeah, it's it's interesting how that type of oh, and also some of it's like oh, I'm getting away with something, and and I think it's also some of the American thing, like just like we don't want to pay our taxes, and you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's sort of. Uh, I mean, I understand that almost nobody wants to pay their taxes, um, but yeah, this is a weird little loop to get stuck in. Where, and what I'm going to compare it to real quick is the art world because. I did bump into a different model when I was traveling in Europe, but in the art world here, primarily, what you do is you put all your time and energy in up front. You make all the work. You develop your own reputational strategies and everything else. And eventually, if you get high enough up there, a gallery will then pick you up, and then you get the privilege of being charged. They take 50% of every sale you make. What a privilege. Yeah, and then you're not allowed to sell out of your house or studio or anything else anymore. All sales then have to go through the gallery. Uh, it's an exclusivity thing. Yes, and so there are privilege. people who still, uh, yeah, the privilege of exclusivity. <laughs> yeah, but there are people who still, of course, try to sell. And just, shh, shh, I'm just going to get rid of this piece on this line. I'll sell it to you at half cost. And But this also comes back to the deal, is that then you're like, oh, I got a deal. I got this art piece for half price. But, of course, you're sort of undercutting your gallery and this kind of reputational economy that exists and everything else. It's kind of screwed up. So I always thought that that was a, a pretty cruddy thing to do to your gallery um, because it just wasn't ethical. Of course, I go over to Europe and I'm in Amsterdam and I'm talking to this guy who used to be an art dealer. And he says, well, you know what we do here is we actually buy the work or we either give uh. the artist a stipend up front and we collect that body of work that they made based off the stipend. Or when they've already got work, we buy it all and we take the pressure on ourselves, just like any other store or any other business. Like a consignment type of thing. Yeah, almost. you or or, or yeah, even or even like retail. You, you just oh, buy stock. That's right. Okay. Like I'm just gonna stock my warehouse with art, and I'm just gonna trust in my taste and the value of these pieces and my ability to sell sell it. And then you have already been paid off. So if I make five times as much, or two times as much, or nothing, you've already got your money. Okay, but the. So the downside of that approach is the artist does have a smaller upside, but they do have a, a for sure payout. Yes. Okay. So so yeah, pros and cons of that, but that is that is nice though. You know. Yeah, it, just a different model and one sure. that doesn't seem to exist here. We seem to think that people should put in all the effort up front here, and then other people will just reap the benefits from it. Right. Uh, and then it's also fascinating because it seems equitable in the fifty fifty split. Yeah. Oh. So so. This is bringing up some of the the, the things um, from this last trip that I went on. So we just went to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, as I was mentioning, which is east of of Knoxville, about an hour hour or so, uh, and it's beautiful out there. There's it's uh, if it's not in, I don't think it's technically in the Smoky Mountains. Maybe it is. It's in the foothills. I don't know exactly how you would draw that line, but uh, you can see a bunch of these mountains, uh, and it's very green. We I think. This was supposed to be like one of the weeks for that to change colors and things like that, but maybe the season's a little late this year or whatever. But uh, so like, I'm sure it's about to have all those colors change and be beautiful there as well. And there's these rivers and all this kind of nice stuff. And then the the town of Pigeon Forge is like this five mile stretch of you know business, 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 and all of those businesses are catering towards travelers. And as you come into town, it actually says mm. like family vacation land or something like that <laughs> and it's like oh you know on one hand like i love the beauty and i loved all these things but it's like okay do i need a bungee jumping place a race car place 17 uh, putt putt uh places <laughs> a 9.99 store a 9.97 store a 9.95 store oh, 17 different ways to get a tattoo on vacation you know like do i need all of these places oh, well apparently you do otherwise they wouldn't exist right uh, well you know what the i'm glad that you are here because today <laughs> if you spend twenty dollars you get a free gift. <gasps> a free gift. A free gift. Oh my goodness. Oh. Where's my twenty dollars? So well, I can guess get what? The free, free gift today is a nice clip. You could it's got a picture <laughs> with a, a bridge on it and you can clip your chips with it. Oh wow. That was For, worth the twenty dollars, right? A, well, I I mean that's a free gift, too, but I gave you the 20 bucks because I like you. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. These are – so this is uh, 
Would you consider this a tourist trap? I don't know. How do you define a tourist trap? That's a good question. And I would be curious if that term changes. Well, is, that a, is that a worldwide term? I guess I don't know. I don't know. know. Like it's, it is kind of curious to think about, but there are spots. It seems like you get into them. And before you know it, you're just participating in this uh, never, never land. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I would, I would say, I, I think, yes, this does seem kind of like a tourist trap, but I don't know. And, and first off, I want to acknowledge, like, uh, I, I think you can have a great time. And I think that thing can be a great place um, for lots of people. And I myself had a great time there, you know, but I just avoided, you know, a lot of the things that were there. But we found a couple of the things that did appeal to us. Right. So one of the things that was there um, was a museum on the Titanic, which was actually really interesting. Um, and it actually had a big old ship. And so that's another interesting thing about the the city was they had all these weird architectural f- features although they're all cheaply not cheaply but you know yeah, not at right. it's, they're not cathedrals and things like that yes. it's it's a ship that's built on the side of the road or a false front of new york city with king kong climbing on <laughs> yeah, it you know right, or, right, right. or or things like that right um but so the museum with the titanic that you know that was cool and i'm sure some of these attractions are cool too as well right uh, but there's just something about having it all right there also in your face and then also the fact that it's yeah like all right, 17,000 of these souvenir stores where you go in and they're all selling, you know, all of these cheap things from China that they've stamped Pigeon Forge on, Forge on and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but yeah, uh, so let's talk about the, the souvenirs aspect. You know, where do you fall oh, on the souvenirs? Oh, man. Oh, what a mess. Um, so I think when I was younger and traveling, I used to collect them, right? So first time i went to germany then i thought it was really important to pick up authentic german beer steins you know things like this uh which of course how do i know they're authentic like i'm (laughs) buying them all from shops that cater to tourists because i don't know where you would get an authentic one right like i'm not having a guy hand make me one for instance right uh which would nor would you want to pay that much for it no no because i want a, a deal yeah. You know, because I'm still young and don't have any money and whatever, blah, blah, blah. But also just ingrained into my mind is how much I'm willing to spend. Uh, but there were little things like that. And then I remember coming out after visiting Rome. And you come outside and there's just vendors everywhere with these carts. And it's all, you know, Madonna and Child. It's all these kind of crucifixes and things like that. Prayer beads. It's all these kind of things everywhere. And you're somehow supposed to, like, there's something about when the religious or the sacred is turned so blatantly into cheap commerce that it becomes very off-putting to me. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, and I've I realized... seen plenty of, uh, just the other day, it's all, you know, like a votive candle or whatever, mm-hmm. and it's got some celebrity on it, right? Something <laughs> yeah, like that. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and, and there's that, that kind of side of it where it becomes sort of more and more crass, or, you know, um, further and further from the thing. But I also recognize that there is something about holding on to something from the place as a sort of sacred moment. So like when the Berlin Wall came down, then there was a big rush to actually get pieces of the Berlin Wall. Like people wanted markers or totems of this historic event. And so there's something about the pilgrimage, about getting close to something that is profound, and then taking something back away from that. Yeah, well, it's interesting you said that because literally within the Titanic Museum, one, you could argue that a lot of museums are exactly that. <laughs> They're collections of artifacts from the theme, oh, yes. right? That's, uh, that's, I think technically that's what they all should be. Yeah. 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 And the uh, and there was a guy who was, I don't know if he was just trying to be an impersonator or if like, he. I think he had a book, but he looked like the captain from Titanic. And I, I think he, I, I don't know his whole story, but someone said he might have like, that like he's way into this right and that's a big part of his life but and he's there and you know he's like oh come here kids and hold this piece of the titanic or whatever and uh and and yeah you see all of these uh random random things that come from that place um but one and they could be every normal everyday things right but they have value and interest because they were from that thing or that place right and i guess that's kind of the point of a souvenir as well no it really is it's uh it's it, the thing can be anything. It can be a seashell you pick up. It doesn't have to have actual value to it, right? The value is what you provide to it. And there's something sort of fascinating about that whenever you go somewhere and they actually are charging you 
for the resemblance of this place as a value of it. Once again, this abstraction, symbolic. You take this thing home, and it's a baby representation of the grander yeah. thing. And you know uh, what gets really baffling too is whenever say you're talking about the uh, you know it's almost like Vegas again with like New York. New York has all the the different cities on, it, and then you can buy things that are New York, New York pins or mock-ups or whatever that are mimicking the actual New York. So you get like further and further away, it gets more and more meta and it gets more and more false. And there is this kind of distance from the original that I guess Baudrillard would call the simulacra that we're actually living in or a simulacrum, which is that we've gotten so far away from the original thing that we don't even recognize it anymore. And I would say that that has a lot to do with this idea of souvenirs and tourist traps where you're embedded in this world where all of a sudden behaviors make sense to you that wouldn't normally make sense i wouldn't normally buy sweaters or t-shirts or socks that say pigeon forge on them but within this space not knowing what else to do and seeing that every store is catering to me shopping i'll probably start shopping oh that's that, that is a good point about yeah being in the context and being in the thing and oh that's a thing that you do right um but uh you know, uh, oh, real quick on the simulacrum, I just wanted to point out that you do have a podcast episode where you're, you're talking about that concept. Do you do you want to? Oh, yeah. So I have, I guess, two episodes on Baudrillard, uh, simulacrum and simulation. And that was one of his texts that, at least in the art world, was very seminal. Um, in theory, in sort of critical theory, then Baudrillard sort of steps into there, but he kind of comes from a different space, and so he's kind of one of those guys that's like, eh, he's questionable. But some of the things that he makes, uh, the easiest relation to make to it is something like The Matrix, uh, which, interestingly, he would say doesn't actually get what he's doing. Uh, but it is this idea that we live in an alternate reality, essentially. But his premise is that we live, we have forgotten the truth because it has moved so far beyond it. So we've lost grounding. So I've got a couple of podcasts on that. And, and if you sort of want to get into it, there is this idea that we have actually liberated ourselves from having meaning as part of our entire liberation process. We have liberated ourselves from needing to have meaning. So now we can exist entirely without meaning in the world. And this is kind of a shocking thing to do is because once your world is so artificial, so fake, and so ungrounded from the rooted principles that actually derived it, then anything you do at that point is based on other levels of fakery until you never can reground again. And so you never do get back to that sacred spot, that sacred place. The sacred is basically defunct, and we just call things sacred now. Uh, that That is uh, interesting, right? And I'm sitting yeah. here kind of thinking and, and staring off into space and... and, and <laughs> And, the, and thinking about how that, I mean, relates very, very closely to what we're doing here, right? And um, uh, when we're talking about uh, the going to this tourist destination and, and buying these touristy uh, tchotchkes and things like that. And it's like, uh, yeah, because it, it also made me think of the, the this book that we're reading, um, Range by mm -hmm. uh is it David Epstein or is it yes, the, yeah Epstein. range by David Epstein and it was talking about how uh there are these psychological studies where they went and they found people who were not in civilization I'm, I'm guessing they would be in probably a first world type of country where like they like have their, their own things that are or... subsistence farming and all that kind of stuff and they have their village but that's like all they know right and they were talking to them and asking them questions and even just like, hey, group these things together or don't group these things together. And they were finding that it was just completely different from what people from a civilized, uh, educated type of world would mm -hmm. do. And it's just like, man, it completely shifts how they view the world compared to how we view the world. And of course, we think our way is better and right and whatnot. Yeah. But kind of what to, to go to what you're talking about the simulacrum like okay well now we've gotten so far as a civilization removed from that base like hey food sex love ex, you know yeah. core needs of the world to the point where it's like hey uh now we uh go to this job every week and then we make yeah. all this money and then we have those 10 days allocated to us where we have to have vacation you know which yeah. we talked about last week um and we do all of these things and it's like so then you're buying this thing you know, maybe for yourself to show that you've been there. Maybe it's to show other people, hey, look at where I went. You know, there's right. all these various reasons that it could be, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, when you're bringing up these sort of indigenous tribes that think differently than we do, um, because, of course, 
we basically we find ourselves operating in an artificial world that we assume to be the truth because we and even if we know we don't know the truth we don't know what else to do the problem with the simulacrum is it plays out before it precedes you there's already a script that's generated and we all end up just being actors within the script yeah and and that we like to claim that we have freedom and autonomy but we're probably just enacting the inevitable and so baudrillard brings this up quite a few times and he even brings it up with the 9 11 that that was essentially scripted through certain um ways of society would operate which got him a lot of blowback but of course when we're talking about these indigenous tribes there is one called the i think puraha or something like this and and they, this guy went down and he was talking to him and he was like, well, what do you do about food? Like, where do you store food? You don't have refrigeration, this, that, and the other. And, and how do you stockpile and save for yourself? And when he was asking them about food, they actually said, I store my meat in the belly of my brother. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What a quote. <laughs> yeah, it's such a good quote. So it really stuck with me when I read that because their concept of the future doesn't really exist. The future and the past don't really exist for them. There's just, there's always been the past. There will always be the future. And the idea that what you should care about is the people next to you. If I have extra meat, my brother's eating it. It isn't for me. So this individualist state that we're in, they just, it's not even part of their culture. So they brought all these people down to like test them for like, well, are these people more happy than us? Cause they don't think about the future. And they just, these people are smiling and happy all the time. And that's how they actually judge happiness. Yeah. Is by the amount people are just like, authentically smiling i like that i like that uh so i want to talk a, a little bit more about the the benefits of travel from seeing that different perspective and seeing how different people view the world thing like that because i don't think we've really touched on that yet um but before we get to that i want to i want to challenge uh, us to talk about some of the the benefits of visiting a, a mm. tourist trap a place that has these types of things and going to those types of places and you know one of the first things that come to my mind is hey that's a vacation that, uh, you know, again, everyone can have their spectrum of what, what they want to do and what they enjoy and what they don't enjoy. And also some of that, you know, I think is largely around children, right? Oh, uh, of course. And yeah. especially with this idea of like, hey, I need something, uh, frankly, shiny to distract these kids and for them to enjoy and have a good time. Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, essentially, I guess you could see this area as a, a – an amusement park of sorts, right? It's like, oh, because, you know, when you go to a Six Flags or a Disney World or whatever, all that is contained within one, you know, fenced off area you have to have tickets to. Mm -hmm. But this is like that, just kind of without the, the outsword, outside fence, if you will. Yeah, it really can be. You know, I mean, there are tourist traps that might be a little more like in Disneyland, for instance, right? Which can be a blast to go to. And you have all these great experiences and it's a lot of fun. But it also is the artificial tourist trap that is stuck in the middle of the larger tourist trap, right? Yeah. And, and that actually gives LA a little bit of validity in that it's at least not as bad as Disneyland. But Disneyland might be more authentic um, in an interesting way because it's catering exactly to who it thinks it's catering to. It is targeted, and in that way, its artifice lends to authenticity. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up, brought up LA because that... Um... Hollywood is one of the places where if you've not been there, you have this picture of what it is, what it's going to be like, all that kind of stuff, because not only of what you've heard about it, what you know about it, but how it fits within culture and then the larger impact of all of the things that it does and it has. Right. But then when you physically go to Hollywood, especially when you go to Hollywood Boulevard yeah. and <laughs> I'm not going to ruin it for those who haven't been there yet, but it's like, uh, it's not exactly what you'd think. It's very much all a bunch of tourists and, you know, there's a homeless guy peeing on the side of the building and then you have all these souvenir shops and things like that and you've got all of this very much like uh extremely touristy areas mm -hmm. and then of course like there's the restaurants and shops that charge more because they know they can and yeah. they don't even give you that great of food because they don't have to all those types of things so that's kind of some of the downsides of it um, but the plus sides of doing these types of things is it gets people out right it gets right, them something right. to do it gives them uh, an excuse or something to have something around to where they can spend time with other people right and yeah. um, that's especially important I think for an American man who um, <laughs> 
<laughs> because men can't do something without having some activity to, to yeah, kind of anchor it right. on. You can't just sit and hang out. It's like, oh, let's play video games or let's watch a sporting event or whatever, right? No, like, no, there always has to be some sort of secondary or you call it primary, but it might actually be secondary uh, to go get out of the house, do the thing, do the trip, know what you're going to do with your day, make plans, you know. Uh, yeah, and I you know the fascinating thing about all the, uh, one of the things that we haven't touched on too much it's also fun so there's a whole lot of benefits to it as far as keeping people active um i was just in chattanooga and they have a place there called rock city and what's fascinating is the rocks themselves are amazing but then they've of course uh made it really kitschy with all these little like trolls and <laughs> things everywhere <laughs> and you're just like this was already beautiful. Why did you do this? Um, but they also put some really cool lights in some of the caves that make it look amazing. And so you end up getting this sort of hyper real experience and it can be really kind of profound. But before you know it, also, everyone's like, I walk 64,000 steps yeah. today because they all have their Fitbits on or whatever. Which is another nice side effect of it, right? Um, but, you know, I guess one if I had to give one big important value or takeaway from this is at the end of the day, like it's up to you as an individual to decide what value you extract from that area. Right. And yeah. if you, you know, you really like getting those t-shirts for whatever reason, like go for it. If you really like the chip clip, get it right. If <laughs> right. you, with the shot glasses that yeah. all have the labels of every place you've ever been. Yeah. There is a collecting aspect to all this as well. Yeah. Well, and then, so some of the souvenirs that I used to collect were shot glasses and, um, koozies, which mm -hmm. is, you know, a can insulator. Right. And I, I really like those and t-shirts and things like that, that are, practical they have some sort of use that you can have so it's not just like a, a souvenir not just an a, a throwaway item type of thing um but also the real reason and this is the real value of souvenirs for me that i've had is they're conversation starters and so now when somebody comes over to my house and i'm like haha i think i'm funny drink <laughs> and you gotta lube, lube yeah, up a little yeah. bit well then they're looking at the shot glass and I'm like oh well, this is from that place. And guess what? That gives some sort of prompt for them. And then their mind goes to all the ways that yeah. they connect with that area or that thing. And then we start to have that conversation. And so that's one of the really uh, big uh, things that souvenirs provided for me. And, and having the koozies and the shot glasses where, one, those are relatively inexpensive and I can have them, but they have a use and they can come out at all these different types of places, you know, and it's like, Hey, look, Oh, you've been to pitch and forge or whatever. I went there and here's my story about it. And then yeah, you just start to engage yeah. on that level. So that's, that's one of the, the values that I see from souvenirs, right. Is being able to share that experience with others and have that prompt to where, you know, one year, five years, 10 years, however long down the line, it's like, Oh, I see that thing. I see that refrigerator magnet or whatever. Tell me about that. You know? Yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic point. And, and we do have those pieces at our house that we have collected and that we still enjoy. And to this day, it is, it's amazing how the sight of an object sitting on a shelf can bring back memories. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm a big fan of having some of those. Uh, it, I think that when I talk about it in the abstract, I can very much like poo poo the entire yeah. industry uh, <laughs> because uh, of course, I also find that a lot of people that operate in the cities and towns that have a lot of tourism, those people can actually be very rude to the tourists. It's almost like they disdain the people on whom their livelihood depends. Right. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And there's a lot that we could get into with travel here. Um, so I'm sure we'll we'll come back to it another day. But I also wanted to make sure to, to tell you live on air and to the, us, our audience, to help help remind us to always look at not just the cynical, critical side <laughs> yeah. of things. Writer, all, writer. <laughs> and it's, that's that's probably the, one of the worst areas of overlap for us because we both instantly jump to see all of the critical small things, right? Uh, but we also need to highlight some of the, the positive things. You know, someone uh, – I'll just call her out. Danielle was watching on the other day when we were talking about getting older and we're sitting there with her, her grandparents are getting older and we're talking about the body's going away. The mind's going away. <laughs> and she's like, do something positive, please do something positive. <laughs> and, and you know, sometimes you need a reminder to, to do something yeah, positive. Maybe right? that's what we need is we need a reminder. Like we need the audience to send in the clip too dark, do something <laughs> else, you know, just like pull us out of our spiral. Yeah. So, challenge for today do you have anything that immediately pops to mind something to 
tying in with travel or souvenirs or or making you know deciding what something is for you or extracting just the good and you know what something along those lines yeah i was just thinking about when we're talking about the objects that i have at the house that there's a couple that i think i want to swap out Uh, we've got some amazing stuff we bought in japan these little cups and things and i want to actually display those more prominently maybe remove some of the things we got from spain or from italy and then do a little swap out Cool. So the challenge for today is, you know, look and see what kind of souvenirs or memories or whatnot that you have from your travel. And one thing I'll make sure to point out is that that does not have to mean that you physically bought something, you know, and some people have never been souvenir people or they were and now they stopped and maybe they just have accumulated so much. Right. Um, But a souvenir does not have to be a physical something that you buy. Uh, one of my favorite things that it can be is a picture, right? You know, and one of the st- things that Danielle and I did a few weeks back was we printed out just on, you know, four by six back in the old days like you used to do. We printed yeah. out a whole bunch of photos for, you know, five, 10, 30 cents a piece or whatever. And now we have them plastered all over our fridge. And they're great positive reminders every day when we walk by them we see and then they're also conversation starters and they're all these great things um and so i would encourage you find out what what souvenirs you have or go through your photos and print something out and put it on display and if you have one that's been there for a while maybe change it out uh or maybe you could have a coffee table book that is hiding on a bookshelf somewhere maybe put it on your coffee table and you know a bu- another bonus if you want to overachieve on this challenge is have somebody over right and yeah. you know you can literally hand it to them and be like hey look here's this thing or you can kind of subtly be like oh come over here by the cheese board oh what what's that over there <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's what yeah why not like just stack your house with all these little conversation starters yeah, yeah. that's a good idea yeah well so with that you guys have a wonderful day and also remember to look at the positive and not just the <laughs> hypercritical don't be like us don't be like us <laughs> y'all have a wonderful day